Hello. As some of you may know, I've written several books on the NFT phenomenon. Although NFTs only started to become mainstream about six months ago, I think that by now everybody has heard about them, right? About how much money people are making by buying and selling and speculating with NFTs. But what few people know is that there are as many as 13 different types of NFTs. It's not just about art. So in today's video, I'm going to quickly show what those 13 different types are all about. Let's look at it. I have divided the 13 types into two groups. The established types and the tentative types. The established ones are the NFT types that are already being bought and sold in significant amounts. The tentative types, on the other hand, are NFT categories that are still not being transacted in significant amounts but that seem to have future potential. Ok, so let's look at the 13 categories now. Number 1. Non-physical art. Many people call this category digital art, but I intentionally use the phrase non-physical art as an umbrella term that comprises all the art that is currently sold on NFT marketplaces and not just digital art. So, since the NFT marketplaces also offer many works of traditional photography, traditional illustration, and even photos of actual physical canvas paintings, and since none of those were created with a computer, I prefer the umbrella term of non-physical art. Because what all these offerings have in common is that these artists are selling only a non-physical version of their work, a digital image of the artwork they created. And even if that digital image was originated as a physical artwork, the physical piece is not included in the offering, or at least not in the majority of cases. As of today, the most expensive NFT ever sold in history belongs to this category of non-physical art. It was an NFT created by the artist Beeple and sold in March 2021 for $69 million. Due to several very famous multi-million dollar sales like this one, Standalone non-physical artworks were the NFT type that captured most of the media attention during the first NFT mania, which took place during February, March and April of 2021. And still today, most people think of art when they think of NFTs. But as we'll see next, the focus changed during the second mania. Number 2. Collectibles Collectibles are currently the hottest NFT category, and they are also the category that started it all. One of the first significant NFT projects ever launched was indeed a collectible. It was called Curio Cards, and it was launched back in May 2017. A month after that, another collectible was launched, the now all famous CryptoPunks. Until very recently, we thought that CryptoPunks had been the first. But lately, the NFT archaeologists rediscovered Curio Cards, and many investors are buying them now, hoping that they can become the next CryptoPunks. And in fact, the word seems to be spreading, and the prices of curio cards, although still much more affordable than punks, are going up. Also, Christie's recent announcement that they will be auctioning a full set of curio cards in October has been a big recognition of the expected price upside of curio cards. Another recent rediscovery by investors has been the collectible projects that were created on the Bitcoin blockchain. And these ones predate even the Ethereum collectibles like Punks and Curios. One of these OG Bitcoin projects that is getting investors most excited right now is Rare Pepe's, a set of 1774 different cards of the famous meme character Pepe the Frog. In each card, Pepe appears depicted in a completely different way, depending on the take of the particular artist who created that card. At the moment of recording this, a new rush has started around Pepe's, which had remained almost forgotten by the mainstream until now. But the prospects of these rediscovered Pepe's are excellent, because not only do rare Pepe's predate practically every other collectible in crypto history, but they are also the first curated art collection that ever existed in NFTs. So many think that, as an investment, Pepe's might be the ultimate blue chip asset, or as I like to say, Pepe's may become to Bitcoin NFTs what CryptoPunks are to Ethereum NFTs. And who knows, maybe even surpass punk prices in the future. But I have just said the word art. And wasn't art the previous category? Well, in fact, some NFT collectibles like Rare Pepe's are at the same time also considered artworks. And another type of NFT that combines collectibles and art, and one that is also selling like hotcakes right now, is generative art collectibles. Actually, this collecting frenzy is probably one of the most recent in the NFT space. 
By the way, another term to define, generative art. Generative art is simply a type of abstract art created semi-automatically by using code. So far, investors interested in generative art collectibles have focused mainly on two projects, artblocks and autoglyphs. Artblocks are reaching higher and higher sums every day because they really do have some very aesthetically appealing pieces, at least if you are into abstract art. Autoglyphs, on the other hand, have very limited aesthetic interest, but have become very expensive due to their being the first generative art collectible in NFT history. And as you may have already noticed, in NFT investing, anything that is deemed to be the first anything immediately becomes a highly priced asset. However, once again, the cryptoarchaeologists have recently rediscovered another generative art project that predates even autoglyphs. That Unearth project is called CryptoArte. CryptoArte is attracting the investors' attention right now for two things. One is because it predates the now super expensive autoglyphs. And so it's the actual first fine art generative collectible in NFT history. But the second reason is that CryptoArte pieces tell the story of the birth of the Ethereum blockchain itself, the chain in which the majority of NFTs are recorded. And that gives CryptoArte an even more special meta and historical cachet. The other type of collectible that has been very successful during this second NFT mania are the avatar projects, also known as PFP projects. PFP stands for Profile Picture because these collectibles can easily be used as your profile picture on Twitter and any other social media networks. The most popular of all profile picture collectibles is the already mentioned CryptoPunks. But every day a new PFP collection hits the digital shelves and some of them have been also very successful with Board Ape Yacht Club being at the moment the second most valued after punks. But still CryptoPunks is the leader and not just among profile picture collectibles, but among all collectibles. So far, the most expensive NFT collectible ever sold was a CryptoPunk. It is called CryptoPunk7523, nicknamed the COVID alien because of its skin color and COVID mask. It was sold in June for the brain bashing sum of $12 million, becoming the most expensive NFT collectible ever sold and the second most expensive NFT ever sold across all types. Number 3. Sports Memorabilia Sports Memorabilia are in reality a subtype of collectible, but they deserve their own category because their client base and their market inner workings are very distinct from the rest of collectibles. By the way, some of the NFTs that we are seeing here today could be in more than one category, because actually NFT categories partially overlap, okay? They are not perfectly separate entities. So, for example, for many people, autoglyphs and art blocks would be categorized as art NFTs rather than collectible NFTs. Or for some people, Sorari, instead of sports memorabilia, would be more like a video game NFT because you can play with it. So, just take that into account. So far, the largest and most successful project in the sports category has been NBA Top Shot. The idea behind this project was very smart. Instead of just copying the traditional sports trading card model in a digital form, they provided something that a physical sports card could never have. Video. Each collectible card from NBA Top Shot is a video highlight showing a famous shot from the history of the NBA. Here is an example of one of these collectible video cards. This video clip called LeBron James Dunk Throwdown Series 1 is the most expensive NBA Top Shot sold to date. It sold at auction in April 2021 for $387,000. The success of NBA Top Shot has been outstanding. With overall sales of well over half a billion dollars as of September 2021, it is the fourth best-selling NFT project of all time, and during the first NFT mania, it was consistently in the first position. Another successful sports collectible project is So Rare. This one is catered to the fans of soccer. So Rare is special in that it is not just a set of collectible cards, but it is also a fantasy sports game that can be played with those same cards. So Rare has had a lot of success, but in sales volume it is still second after NBA Top Shot. The most expensive So Rare sold to date is this rather underwhelming looking card of Cristiano Ronaldo that sold for $290,000 in March 2021. 
By the way, it's also the most expensive soccer trading card in history, overtaking even the most expensive physical soccer trading card, a card of Erling Haaland that sold for $125,000. But what about the National Football League, that staple of American sports culture? Well, there isn't yet an NFT collection for it, but when somebody decides to launch one, they are surely going to attract a crazy amount of investors and fans. So if you are interested in sports investment, do watch that space. Number 4. Video game assets. If collectibles are winning the battle of the now, video game NFTs are well placed to win the battle of the future. Most cunning NFT investors and gurus have their eyes set on the next big thing, and that thing is video game asset NFTs. And it's not just pie in the sky, the first big experiment in NFT gaming has already taken place and has been a massive success. At the beginning of this second NFT mania, an NFT game, Axe Infinity, became the highest selling NFT project by total sales volume, surpassing the until then leaders NBA Top Shot and CryptoPunks. It is true that after that event, the investor focus, the headlines and the second mania has revolved mostly around collectibles. But the success of Axie has pushed investors with longer term vision to begin to track NFT games obsessively in search for the next Axie. They think that Axie is only the beginning and that what is to come will dwarf it. But why all this confidence in the future of NFT games? Because many tech experts have made the prophecy that one day NFT video games could become the killer application for crypto. But what is a killer application? In the tech world, a killer application is a project that attracts mainstream users to a platform that until that point had only been used by geeks. Okay, it is true that cryptocurrencies and NFTs are used by lots of people already, not only by geeks. But compared to the hundreds of millions of users that use entertainment platforms like video streaming or like traditional video games, crypto is still a tiny community. NFT video games could change this. The reason why there is so much hope in NFT video games becoming this killer app is that the gamers who play traditional video games are already familiar with micropayments. They regularly use micropayments on their phones and consoles to buy video game assets in the traditional games they play. So buying those same video game assets as NFTs will come quite naturally to them. And that's why the barrier of entry for this demographic is very low. Another reason for the predicted quickly adoption is that video game users are by and large a more tech-savvy demographic. So the learning curve of using NFTs will feel much less steep for them than for other older demographics like art collectors. But how do video games use NFTs? It's quite simple. In normal video games, you can own assets like characters, weapons and tools, or even plots of land. Well, with NFT-powered video games, each of those assets that you own and use in the game is an NFT. This means that you can use those assets inside the game, but since they are NFTs, you can also take them out of the game and sell them on NFT marketplaces to other gamers or to NFT investors. This opens the door to making money from an activity that you enjoy. And can you think of a more powerful value proposition than making money for doing your favorite activity? This is called play to earn, and it's not a surprise that investors are so excited. An example of this speculation already taking place is also Axie Infinity. Part of that game consists of holding Pokemon-style battles between the game characters, which are called Axies. Well, each of these blobby characters is actually an NFT, and that NFT can be used to play, but it can also be sold and speculated with. Initially, Axis could be purchased for just a few dollars, but due to their massive user adoption, they are now trading for at least a few hundred dollars each. And that's nothing, some of the rarest Axis go for much more. Last July, one of them was sold for $800,000. Not bad for a video game character, right? Number 5. Virtual Land this category partially overlaps with the previous one, because many crypto video games also sell plots of land. But the category of virtual land encompasses more than just video game land. It also includes the land from general purpose virtual worlds, or, as some like to call them now, the metaverse. General purpose virtual worlds 
are distinct from video games in the sense that although you can also use them as games to some extent, their principal purpose is social and commercial. They want to partially replace physical reality and the social and commercial activities that we carry out in that physical world. If they succeed, they will become a parallel immaterial version of our planet in which activities like meeting people, conducting business, teaching, learning, doing political activism, displaying art or placing advertising could take place. Imagine the ROI potential for the owners of the virtual land on which all those activities take place. At present, not virtual world, either crypto or non-crypto, has ever gained the traction of, say, a Facebook or a Twitter. But the reward for the first virtual world that ever gets that kind of user adoption will be enormous. Do you remember that virtual world that became very famous in the 2000s, but which ultimately failed? It was called Second Life. Well, the central land is quite similar to Second Life, but it's powered by blockchain technology and NFTs. The land of the Decentraland world is divided into a grid of plots of land that can be bought and sold on the NFT marketplaces. Each shape in this grid that you see here represents one of those purchasable plots. Decentraland is still rather unpolished technically and the user adoption is lacking. But it is gaining a lot of traction as a speculative investment, with investors betting on its future adoption by buying plots of its land. As of today, the most expensive plot of land sold on the central land was this large plot that you can see here highlighted in red. It sold in July 2021 for almost $1 million. For now, however, this space is mostly speculative as there are very few people actually roaming the streets and fields of the central land. However, many investors are confident in the future of these and other metaverse worlds and that's why they buy these LAN NFTs even if the users are really not quite there yet. It is very interesting though to take a look at the central LAN by yourself. It is free to use, so you just need to go to their website and create a user. It is a very contradictory experience. When you walk through the central LAN, at the same time you feel inspired by how much potential such a world could have and disappointed by how empty it is. Will the central LAN succeed in the end? it is very difficult to predict. But what is clear is that at some point somebody will create a virtual world that finally succeeds. And when that moment comes, that 3D social network is going to dwarf in importance and value the likes of Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and all of our current 2D social media platforms. That's why investors buy land in these empty worlds, just in case one of them is the one. Number six, meme NFTs. I was tempted to include this category inside non-physical art because ultimately memes are just another type of digital art. But memes also have such a distinct role culturally that they can be analyzed as a grouping of their own. Even during the NFT market slowdown of May, June, 2021, meme sales didn't stop and actually the largest meme sale of all time took place during that period. In June 2021, the original Doge meme sold for $4 million. Other famous memes that have sold for a staggering amount have been Nian Cat, which sold for $580,000, Disaster Girl for $473,000, and Overly Attached Girlfriend for $411,000. But there are many other big bag sales. I've published the most comprehensive list of all the most expensive meme NFTs of all time on my website scarce.guide. So in case you are curious to see some more, I'll leave a link in the description. Number seven, domain name NFTs. Crypto domains are a special type of domain name that for the most part end either in .eth or in .crypto. Recently, their sales have exploded, and now many of the most obviously juicy names are already taken. However, there are still many good top-tier domains that are a little less obvious and that haven't been registered by anybody yet. Similarly, many good second-tier domains are not yet taken, and they can be yours for as little as $5 plus gas fees. 
For example, I just picked this one a few days back, Granada.it. Granada is an important tourist city in Spain. Nothing that is going to make me rich, of course, but definitely not a bad name for $5. And that's just for the unregistered domains, because many of the domain names that were already registered can still be purchased. You can buy them on the secondary market that exists on OpenSea. But despite a significant number of domain name transactions, still few people have heard of crypto domains. And many of those who have can't really tell the difference between a traditional domain name like chipflights.com and a crypto domain name like chipflights.eth. So what's the difference then? Crypto domains, like regular domains, can also be used as website addresses. But unlike traditional domains, crypto domains don't depend on any centralized authority, and that makes them impossible to censor. Once you buy it, the domain is yours and no higher authority can take it away from you. On top of that, crypto domains also have a second use case that regular domains don't have. They can be used to easily point a user towards a crypto wallet. Crypto wallets are the places where people store the cryptocurrencies and the NFTs they own. But these wallets have complex addresses consisting of a long alphanumeric string. So if you buy a crypto domain and link it to your wallet, you can use it instead of that long alphanumeric string. So whenever somebody needs your wallet address to send you money or to send you an NFT, instead of having to look up the impossible to remember string, you can just say it from memory. Oh yes, please send me that NFT to John Doe.is. The most expensive crypto domain ever sold was ArtDAO.is, and the sale took place just a few days ago. The domain was sold for almost $200,000. In case you don't know the term DAO, it means Decentralized Autonomous Organization, and it's the word that describes the associations that groups of individuals can create in the crypto space to pursue any kind of group goal. The most expensive domain with a .crypto ending was the domain win.crypto, which sold for $100,000. Also, another sign of increasing crypto domain adoption is that Badweiser bought the domain beer.it last month. They bought it for almost $100,000, and by doing so, they became the first big brand to publicly buy a crypto domain. In terms of user adoption, the ending.it seems to be more sought after than .crypto. Probably because the community that most uses this domain so far is the NFT art and NFT collectible community, and they are very used to Ethereum, and so the ending dot is naturally appeals to them. Crypto domains have some problems though. One of them is that browsers don't yet support them natively. So their utility to host websites is limited because users need to change the settings of their browsers if they want to access a site that uses a crypto domain. And let's be honest, no regular browser user will bother to do that. However, some underground browsers like Opera are already offering native support for these domains. And if at some point Google's Chrome or Apple's Safari begin to do the same, then user adoption will certainly skyrocket. But despite this limited support and awareness, there's already a lot of speculation going on in the NFT marketplaces among a few maverick investors who are registering, selling and reselling these domains. One of the things that is driving this speculation is the fact that people are actually already using them, at least for their wallet addresses. Another reason is that, once again, investors don't want to miss out on the next big thing. And many people still remember with a sinking heart how in the 90s they didn't think of registering for a few bucks domain names that a few years later would sell for millions. Okay, so that's it for the seven established NFT categories. Let's move now to the six tentative ones. Number eight, tweets. Some people will be surprised to find tweet NFTs classified as tentative when the tweet NFT category has already made so many headlines. But I've placed it here because all those headlines were about one single sale, Jack Dorsey's tweet. That's the only big sale in the entire Tweet NFT space since it appeared. That one big transaction took place in March 2021, almost at the beginning of the first NFT mania, and consisted of the sale of Jack Dorsey's first ever tweet. For those who don't know him, Jack Dorsey is the founder and CEO of Twitter. 
His tweet sold for an eye-popping $2.9 million. Yes, the equivalent of three small mansions for one tweet. But apart from that mega sale, this space hasn't seen any other big transactions. For example, if you go to Variables by Cent, the marketplace where tweet NFTs are bought and sold, and you order all the past transactions by sale price, you get this. As you can see, the top sale listed, Jack Dorsey's, at $2.9 million, is miles away in price from the second one at just $23,000. And from there on, the prices go downhill very quickly. Only three sales in the 20K range, only three in the 10K range, only eight in the 10K to 5K range, and so on. And what's more, say for one single exception, those few transactions above $1,000 all took place in May or earlier. Big tweet sales virtually ended at the same time that the first NFT mania did. This doesn't mean that tweet NFTs can't become an established category in the future. There could easily be a renaissance of tweet NFTs in a few months, especially if some very high profile celebrity tries to sell one of their most iconic tweets. Definitely the world has seen weirder. Just think of how in May 2021 nobody could imagine that the joke coin Doge could become the fourth most valuable crypto coin by market cap. So it's definitely not impossible to imagine tweet NFTs becoming a consolidated investment asset in the future. In fact, some people think that someday every tweet with historical significance ever created will be very valuable, like a politician's tweet announcing that they are running for president, a celebrity coming out of the closet, etc. Another type of tweet that could become a thing in the future is tweets in which something appeared for the first time, such as the first tweet in which the word love was ever displayed, the first tweet in which the word money appeared, the first with a dollar symbol in it, and so on. In fact, a budding example of this occurred in April this year. It was the sale of the tweet in which Chris Messina invented the hashtag. That tweet sold for $10,000, and if tweet NFTs end up becoming more than a passing fad, then tweets like Messina's could be resolved in the future for much more money than that. Number 9. Music NFTs Music NFTs are like tweet NFTs in the sense that they have made a lot of media noise thanks to a few high-profile sales. But also, like tweet NFTs, outside of those special cases, music NFTs are still hardly moving any significant amount of money. As of today, the most high-profile music NFT release was Kings of Leon's album When You See Yourself in March 2021. It was hyped as the first time an album was released as an NFT. But that's not exactly right. What truly took place was that, a few days before they released their album via the traditional commercial channels, they made a pre-release of a few copies on an NFT marketplace. But the core selling of their album was made through the traditional channels. Another musician who also earned a lot of attention and money with her NFT release was Grimes. Like Kings of Leon, she also was one of the first musicians to the NFT party launching her NFTs at the beginning of the first NFT mania. But what she released was more in the realm of video art than in that of music NFTs. Her video creations had some background music, true, but the focus was on the 3D animations and, in fact, they were sold on a marketplace specializing in art. In summary, despite quite a large amount of hype, there's been only a limited number of significant music transactions in NFTs. Also, although there are lots of experiments taking place in music NFTs at the moment, there still isn't a successful specific marketplace where you can buy and sell music NFTs. Probably the reason for music NFTs not getting the same kind of traction that art and collectibles get is that there isn't a good business model yet. The day somebody figures out a good way of selling music NFTs to hundreds of thousands or even to millions of people in a way that truly makes commercial sense, and that sets up real value for users, music NFTs may become an established category. The business model is the Gordian knot here. Number 10. Literary NFTs Probably literary NFTs are the category on this entire list with the least traction at the present time. However, I can see how this could change in the future, especially with poetry. NFTs were embraced so passionately by the digital art community because NFTs allowed digital artists to monetize a product that they couldn't easily monetize before. 
Well, I think that NFTs can do the exact same thing for the least monetizable of all literary forms ever, poetry. You can probably count with your two hands the number of people in the world who actually live off reading poetry, perhaps even with just one hand. By turning poems into unique collectible products, the same could happen to poems that has already happened to digital images, to memes and to tweets. Because in the same way that people are buying the bragging rights to owning skillful images, why not buying the bragging rights to owning skillful poems? By the way, if somebody wants to team up to create a poetry NFT marketplace, I have a very exciting roadmap in my head. You can send me a message on Twitter. As for other forms of literature like novels, short stories or non-fiction, I can see how short stories could also benefit from tokenization since the writers also make hardly any money from them at present. However, I don't see them getting as much traction as poetry due to their length. Regarding full-length novels and other types of books like non-fiction works, there's no reason why you couldn't sell a whole book as a unique autographed NFT. But so far, this hasn't become a thing, and the most common use case for writers has been to sell bonus material in the form of NFTs. There's still no famous fiction author, though, who has released bonus material as NFTs. As of today, the only author who has gotten significant media coverage about their bonus material was an author of non-fiction. It was Anand Girit Haradas, who sold several NFTs related to his book Winners Take All. However, despite being almost unexplored by the mainstream, the bonus material for literary NFTs has a lot of potential, in my opinion. For example, I can easily see how the bonus NFTs of a famous author like J.K. Rowling could sell for a small fortune. NFTs like exclusive photos of the napkin notes she made when she was planning Harry Potter, of the alternative book covers she discarded, of the chapters she removed during editing, of the first draft of her book, or a one-of-one -one exclusive voice recording of her reading her novel only for your ears. The list is unending, and they would all very likely fetch crazy prices. Some probably would be in the millions. Number 11. Physical real estate. The tokenization of physical world assets like physical real estate or physical art is still in its infancy. For example, there's not a single dedicated platform for buying and selling them, and not even the generalist marketplaces have a section for them. However, a few tentative projects in the space of physical real estate tokenization have already begun. But first of all, what is tokenization? In simple terms, to tokenize is to attach an NFT certificate to something in order to make it sellable in the crypto space. In this way, you can sell a real house or a plot of land that really exists in the physical world by buying and selling the associated NFT that will act as the proof of your ownership. In these cases, the NFT becomes some sort of fancy techno property deeds. Buying and selling houses using NFTs could speed up real estate transactions and remove a lot of the red tape and a lot of the intermediaries that we need today to sell properties. But the tokenization of real-world assets has a second advantage, and one that could completely change the real estate market. Instead of selling a house or a plot of land as a single entity, you can break them down into multiple NFTs and therefore create something similar to company shares for a real estate property. This will give non-wealthy investors access to blue-chip real estate opportunities. For example, very few people can afford to buy a commercial building on Manhattan's Fifth Avenue, or one of those huge I.O. one plots of farmland. But by tokenizing and fractionalizing them, anybody could get a piece of the pie. And what's more, you won't just profit from your NFT when you resell it at a higher price. While you hold your property NFT, you will also receive the proportional rental profit that the commercial building is making or the proportional farming profit that the land is generating. It will be very similar to owning stocks in a company that gives dividends. By the way, the sale of the first house ever sold as an NFT has already taken place. It happened just three months ago in June 2021. It was this apartment in Kiev that belonged to the founder of the influential news site TechCrunch, Michael Arrington. The apartment sold on the auction site Scene.house for 36 ETH. Number 12. Physical art. This category is very similar to physical real estate in how it works. You can both tokenize any existing piece of physical art 
by linking its ownership to an NFT certificate. And you can also break down its ownership into many subunits and attach each portion to a different NFT certificate that can be sold separately. And no, the actual physical artwork won't be broken down, of course. Tokenization could change the world of art investing radically. First, it would allow the average Joe to invest in super expensive but very profitable artists like Picasso or Leonardo da Vinci. Second, it would bring enormous liquidity to the art world. At present, blue chip fine art investing is a very liquid territory. If you are the owner of some highly prized piece of art, it's not easy to find a quick buyer when you need to sell. No matter how important and scarce that art it is. Because there are only so many billionaires and big institutions with that kind of purchasing power who are looking to buy when you are looking to sell. But if costly artworks were broken down into shares and sold on exchanges, then you can easily see how revolutionary that would be. Art investing could become similar to stock market investing. But where would the actual work of art go? Well, since the physical art can't be broken down into pieces to give to the multiple owners, some kind of custodian company would have to take care of it. Or even better, the artwork could be lent to a museum so that they can be the temporary custodians. That's an amazing win-win scenario, because the more exposure your art gets, the more expensive it becomes. So it would be in the interest of the shareholders of that artwork that a museum displays it and the museum, in exchange, would expand its collection for free. Wouldn't it be the ultimate flex to go to the Louvre Museum and say, that painting over there, I own a piece of it. Number 13. Functional NFTs. Rather than one single category, functional NFTs are an entire whole family of different types. But all those types share one thing in common, and that thing differentiates them from the previous 12 types we've seen. You can't use functional NFTs as an investment. They are not assets. Instead, functional NFTs are more akin to tools, digital tools. These NFTs are used because their technical characteristics are useful for simplifying bureaucratic processes or other types of activities, rather than because of their inherent value as an asset. Some of the many examples that could be mentioned are medical record NFTs, identification NFTs, event ticket NFTs, supply chain NFTs, or academic degree NFTs. Functional NFTs are a very experimental area, with very few projects already implemented. But the potential is big, and many common activities that require identifying somebody or something in a unique and unforgeable way can benefit from NFT technology. However, if you are an investor looking for assets to buy, this category is not really relevant to you. So that's it. Those are the 13 different types of NFTs that exist right now. Of course, I've left out a few micro types that I didn't think were important enough to even make, uh, make it as a tentative category. One of those is username NFTs. Some people are um, registering their NFTs on the central land and then trying to sell them uh, as an NFT because on the central land, every username is an NFT. That you can sell but the problem is that so few transactions are taking place and the whole thing feels so specific that i didn't think it was worth uh, having a category yet the other thing is um, code nfts in this case it's the opposite there was a massive transaction five million dollars um, it was tim berners lee the creator of the world wide web who sold the code for the World Wide Web. I think it was in Sotheby's or in Christie's and it was for $5.4 million. So that's massive, right? But it was just a one-off thing. There's not really other transactions in, taking place in code. So I didn't think that was worth either having a full category for, for itself, right? Um, and that's it. Those are the 13 different types uh, that I could find. Uh, but if you think I've left out something uh, very important, please leave a message uh, down below. And uh, that's all for today. Thank you so much for watching till here this crazy long video. And if you want to see more, probably not as crazy long videos on NFTs, you can subscribe to this channel. And thank you. Take care. Bye.